generalize this into some nonlinear model. Uh, but first we will take a step back. And the way, so here I have a note to self, and I will remember that one. So when, we did the, when I did the study for this project in the spring, I actually looked at many different neural networks. Um, you could have a, just a feed forward network on top of your embeddings in the latent space and so on. There are many different ways of doing that. And I didn't manage to actually come up with a solution that worked better than, than what I already had um, back then. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why I thought that, okay, let's try this uh, autoencoder instead. Um, so that's the reason why I've chosen this one. I take that, let's take something state-of-the-art, maybe that works. And I'm not sure state-of-the-art is not actually correct. Let's take something recent. <clears throat> um, so, okay. Now we take a step back to just to explore the idea with autoencoders. So basically I have a very simple graphical model. I have some hidden variable z and some observed stochastic variable x. So the example here is that I want to infer income of owners of car, but only observe the car. I will never observe their incomes. So it will be a hidden stochastic variable. I can never observe it. But I, anyway, I want, to, I want to make some inference on the hidden variable. Um, in, our case, um, in our case, x is the click history, basically what you have interacted with, what uh, papers you have written. And my, my hidden stochastic variable is how these click histories are embedded into some latent space. And when, when you have this sort of graphical model or Bayesian formulation, what you usually do is that you use Bayes' theorem um, and you try to estimate the probability of z given x in terms of this function. Um, so that's the, take the likelihood times the prior and you normalize it with something that doesn't depend on your parameters, you just throw it away. And that's how we usually do Bayesian inference. So usually this, to find analytical solutions to this problem is usually impossible, we call it untractable. And you can approximate this a little bit and it, it's still untractable. <laughs> so what people usually do in the standard Bayesian setting is that they use some kind of brute force method, which is Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, and the state of the art method there is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which makes me happy because I'm a physicist. Uh, and this is what's implemented in Stan and Pi MC3 and so on. Um, and that's the classical brute force method. Now we try to be a little bit, because the problem is that that works for small amounts of data. When you go to big amounts of data, that takes forever. So it's not really tractable in terms of, uh, because we have to grow very old because we get, before we get the answer. So what people do now, some people do, something called variational inference. Um, and that's also implemented in, in the Bayesian packages like Stan. Um, and variational inference has been around for a while. Um, and what you do is that you approximate the posterior distribution with some distribution that you choose yourself, some Q set. Um, and you take it to be of a tractable form, such that inference becomes possible after you do some pretty advanced math. Uh, you have to do kullback leibler divergences. Uh, you get something called the evidence lower bound, and you try to optimize on that and so on. Anyway, it's some, some heavy math, but you get to something in the end that you actually can calculate, and you can uh, calculate the approximation of this posterior. Uh, and that has been, people have been doing that for a long time. And, but b because it was not deep, people didn't talk about it, but <laughs> re recently some guys called Kingma and Welling, some uh, European guys, which is good, yay Europe, um, tried to do this in terms of neural networks. Um, and they actually phrase it in terms of the autoencoder, um, and we go into the details. Basically, the encoder describes the posterior probability and the decoder describes the likelihood. And that's sort of the connection here. Um, and the, the, the funny thing is that paper is basically just math heavy and they just have the neural networks as an appendix. But that's really what's caught on. And it's very citations. Paper, paper has a lot of citations. Uh, but basically, we can view this in terms of this nice graphical <coughs> model. 
We swap my x, that's my history, click history, that's the stochastic variable I observe, and I make uh, my variational distribution as a normal a Gaussian distribution in terms of a mean and the standard deviation, and I calculate this latent representations from those. I add some stochastic term here, for technical reason we will go into later, and then I try to go back. So that's my uh, encoder, and this is my decoder step. So I try to get back to the x I started with. And so z here is given by a normal distribution in terms of two functions, mu and sigma, that are functions of my x. And then I have my latent representation, and I try to go back in terms of some other function I want to train to get back on some click probabilities. And I assume that my actual click, click his probabilities my click history is multinomially distributed according to these probabilities I can calculate. Uh, so that's the framework here. Okay. I, my variational distribution is a Gaussian, and that creates my latent representation. And then I go back, calculate probabilities of you choosing each item in your item history, and assume that's multinomially distributed. Um, so here, for example, NY is the number of tokens you have written about. So that's all in Professor X's articles. So here I made a joke. Um, because X, Professor E here is an X. And there's also Professor X, of course. And since we all like Star Trek, and that's sort of Star Trek because it's Stuart, I'm making very, very <laughs> not a joke. OK. And then my functions here are feed-forward networks that I try to train. Um, then I have some normalization constant uh, that I throw away. And this is sort of the, this is the mathematical description, and this is the description in terms of a neural network. So I have my input vector, and now, okay, I'm skipping here, but this is, now I take my click history just to be a big vector for each author, where I have ones for the items they have interacted with, and zeros for the other ones. So that's my x here. Uh, and I feed that into my encoder network. That could be some couple of hidden layers here until I get into a point where I try to estimate some mu and some sigma. And that's combine that into, to, from the Gaussian distribution into some set, my latent representation. And now I decode that back to my x again. So I don't know, right. So, uh, X is the size of all the items I have in my catalog. Basically, all the words that have been written about. So you need to limit that X? No, no. well. I mean, isn't the problem that it's so big? Basically. I mean, it can be. No, but that's. Uh, well, of course, it can be a problem that it's big. And if it's too big that it's, I don't, cannot fit it into memory, for example, I can have a sparse representation of it. Uh, and. It's also a problem in ter terms of convergence of my model and how good the model is that if it's too big, because I would just train on a lot of zeros. <laughs> exactly. So that's, but it's not the fundamental problem of the theory. It's a practical problem in terms of time and feasibility. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. the tech, yeah. But then you have a lot of columns uh, which are basically not relevant, whereas the feature importance is really low. So, so, so why not excluding them? But, so here I only, right, I'm skipping here a little bit, but this is just a collaborative filtering approach. So I, I skip the features here. I don't have a representations of the features. Uh, but, yeah. Um, but x is a vector. X is a vector, yes. For every user? For every user. Every user has a vector, which is basically the the representation of their history. Yeah. And here, here, of course, I, it, also, it again com shows up that this is time independent, mm -hmm. because I only have the history on terms aggregated up to a certain point. Yeah, um, right, skipping it, some details here, but good that you're interrupting me. Let's see, is the normal distribution that's common for all users and items, I guess? That's yes. One, one big multinomial. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, no, well, yeah. The, so f in this formula, each I will train my neural networks so that I get a mu for each user and a sigma for each user. But <coughs> tied that to, uh, you said that the, the, the encoder here is the, would be the likelihood space, exactly. which is every user's likelihood of, of choosing, the, choosing. choosing the history they actually had. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's just in a normal encoder decoder scenario where I have a representation, I encode it into some representation here set, and then I try to decode it back into a representation that has what I started with. Mm. And the idea here is, of course, that when I have representations in my latent space Z, I can uh, use that to make inference. Uh, so, now, how many have looked at PyTorch code? Cool. So now we will go into how to build this in PyTorch. So now it will basically be just PyTorch, the rest and then we'll, in the end, we'll get back to recommenders when we calculate the metrics of how good the model becomes. Can I ask why you have chosen Yes. So I was kind of late into the deep game. So I had the opportunity of choosing the framework I liked the most. Uh, and when I just made the assessment, I think that PyTorch is attractive from the point of view that it's very Pythonic, that it becomes really readable Python code. Uh, the, the graphs are dynamic, so you can do more crazy stuff with it. Basically, that's my arguments. Um, I mean, I, 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 I probably you have flame words about this all the time in the group. Um, I mean, it's just, I think it's nice. But, yeah. um, so, now we, be, we need to represent this auto encoder and we actually what makes it variational is that uh, we'll, we'll get into that later when we come to back to the Kubak library divergences <coughs> and so on when we want to train it because we want to have a loss function when we optimize this so that's where the variational part comes in um, but basically in PyTorch you define your model as a class Python class in its initiation steps and here I have my uh, encoder part, I call it Q because it's my variational distribution and it's just a feed-forward network in terms of some linear ra layers that I have as a parameter and then I have the decoder it's my P, my likelihood uh, and that's again so just some, some layers here that are uh, yeah, stacked to get back what I started with so the, the, the only suspicious thing so far here is that I make the last layer to be twice the size so that I can encode both my mean and my standard variance, standard deviation. Um, right. That's the structure. I have a soft max in the end because I want to have probabilities of my multinomial distribution and some dropout in the beginning just to regularize. Although I think I put the dropout probability to zero in the end because it was regularizing too much. Um, and now I have the Q network. And this is just some feed-forward code looping through the network, tan h as the activation function. Now becomes some, some suspicious thing here. Uh, my last layer is that I take the first half of my last hidden layer to be the mu, and the other one, the, the second part, to be logarithmic variance. Um, and I can back, back the standard deviation from from that by using the exponent, exponentiating half of it. Um, and now I do Kubak library divergence. I, so with it, I had a pedagogical problem when I did this notebook, was to introduce all the theory to begin with, we start looking at the code before we go to the next part of the theory, and I decided to have the second part of the theory after I introduced the code. So, but you, you can judge me afterwards if that was good or bad. Uh, but anyway, here comes a term we will explain later. And the decode step is just yeah, feeding it through the, the P. And now you have, 
Right. So in, in PyTorch, you define my neural network needs to have two functions. My initiation function that defines the network, and then that forward function that defines that how do I run forward this network. And then it uses auto, um, auto differentiation to do the back propagation step. Right. So here I just run it through my encoder. Uh, some more theory that relates to the variational part. And then decoding again, putting softmax and getting back stuff. So I get my likelihood that my log pies. Um, and this kulbach liver divergence term. Let me just check. <laughs> Crap. The theory part is gone. That's not good. Um, I must have accidentally deleted it. Should I try to find it? I think I have a backup somewhere. Yeah, let's do Bitbucket. It's already, it's already out there. Oh right, it cannot represent it. Um, can I download this somehow, or should I try to? There is some parser of the notebook. Sorry, this is embarrassing. Just download it and put it in the same folder as the tab. Yeah, yeah right. Um, Control S. Maybe I can find one. Right. Good that you make copies of stuff sometimes. <clears throat> um, so, sorry about that. Um, so I have this variational distribution, and I try to calculate something to optimize on. And I won't go into the details, but you get end up with something called the evidence lower bound in the end. And that's basically a sum of two terms. Something that is some expectation under my variational distribution of the log likelihood. And something that is called the kulbach library term, which is the uh, difference in the space of distributions between my posterior and my prior. Um, if that makes sense. Um, and in this case, we can think of this divergence as a difference between the decoder and the encoder functions. Um, so that's basically, and I need to train my neural network to optimize on this term. Um, so that's why I need to, and the Kulbach library is describing my encoder. So I need to take that from that part of the code this is my encode step. Here I calculate this Kubak library term, and I feed it backward, free, feeds it forwards, so I have it from my forward step. Um, but it's we're not, we're not done there yet, really, because but you're right. So, so is that uh, like uh, uh, fitting this distribution to match the other distribution? In, yeah. in terms of the mean or of, of this? No, no, well, it's not that simple. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but it's complicated. Uh, yes. Well, hmm? yeah, uh, I don't know if I wrote a comment about this somewhere. No. Um, no, well, it's the Kulbach library term. You cannot optimize it on its own, so it's it's just a metric. It's it's just a 
one of the two terms I need in my, yeah. my so it's the left hand side that I need to optimize here. Um, and it's, as you see, it's the difference between my encoder and the posterior, so it's not exactly what you said, if I understood you correctly. So, but the problem here is that I'm doing Bayesian neural networks, and in Bayesian I have a stochastic component, but I cannot represent that easily in backpropagation, because backpropagation cannot backpropagate through stochastic variables. So I need to use a trick in terms of my variational distribution, that says that my posterior is the sum of my mu and a stochastic variable times my sigma. And now I have separated my stochastic part from my posterior into just some random normally distributed thing here, epsilon. So if we go back to the code, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, that's what I'm doing here in the forward step. I sample some epsilon here, and I get my set, my set by using this, re, how to rewrite the normal distribution. And because I have se separated the stochastic step into just this epsilon, I can do back, back propagation. But it's, this is called a reparameterization trick, and it's when you do variational uh, autoencoders, you need to do this to be able to train your neural network. Um, and also, the whole point with doing variational inference here is that I could turn these equations into a tractable form. So what they do in this uh, yeah, 2013 people with the uh, guys from the Netherlands, uh, they basically calculate what the analytic form of the equations you get in the end. So you can calculate the likelihood in terms of something we can calculate, and the kullback leibler divergence into, again, something that we can calculate. So that's what I did up there in the code, to actually input these analytic formulas into the PyTorch network. And now I get into the final loss that I want to optimize on, which is basically the sum of the likelihood part and the Kullback library divergence of my encoder. Um, and this is the loss I will optimize on when I, when I train my network. Um, oh, I have another remark here I don't really remember. But, um, right. Yeah, so the, the, the framework here is completely different from what we did before the pause. Uh, now I have my whole click history eat item, um, and I don't have to do this negative sampling or ranking loss or whatever, I just have my click history. An important thing to note here is of course that I don't have a natural way of, of putting my features into this framework anymore. But um, you lose some, you gain some. Um, and now so, I... Right. But so this doesn't handle the, the cold start problem, essentially? This has the cold start problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. yes. Um, <laughs> which I realized halfway through I had implemented it, so it was too late to go back. Uh, <laughs> um, you said you lose the, the ability to express your problem in a natural way. This is a no, but I mean, there's no natural way to fit in the features into this graphical model I had. I mean, maybe there is some way to do that, but they don't do it in the paper, and I haven't, f haven't figured out a way to do it myself, even though uh, there probably is a way. I don't really know how, it, and, the, and they don't do it in the paper. Mm -hmm. So now they we're actually back to the, to the collaborative filtering approach where you don't have features. We're not in the hybrid, hybrid, hybrid land anymore. Um, okay, so now I, I uh, that's my model, and now I, need to do train this one. And I tried to do it in terms of sparse vectors and I realized I couldn't represent, uh, I couldn't train on sparse vectors in PyTorch for some reason. Um, right, but I can, I, I, I have some dense vectors, which is of course problematic because I have so many items. And even though it, it's a really small data set, it still becomes, uh, yeah, uh, problematic of course. Um, this is my training function that I execute um, when I'm, I'm looping through my, my data set. So this is executed for each batch. Mm. And I initialize the so optimizer. Oh, where did I? Uh, I started the optimizer somewhere here. I, anyway, I take it to be... Uh, 
Ada grad or Adam or something like that. I didn't go through them all, I just picked one. Um, and I run through the, this is the forward step. I calculate the negative log likelihood. I do some regularization here. Um, this is basically just taken from the paper. I haven't really figured out if this was a good idea or not. Uh, and then I calculate this negative elbow from the negative, like, negative log likelihood, and that's from my decoder. And I have my kullback library term, and I have the regularization. So this is basically just what I had from the theory. And I do the backward step. Backward step in PyTorch is just dot backward, and then I run it through. Uh, so this is how the training is done. Ah, oh, here I do the optimizer. Uh, oh, so it's <clears throat> and then here I take one hidden layer, and it's, bit, it's symmetric, the network. You don't need to have it symmetric, but here I have a de decoder and the encoder is symmetric. So that's one hidden layer with uh, 100 nodes, and then I say that my Z vector is 10, so that my latent space is 10-dimensional, as I did with the light FM. Uh, yeah, this was Adam. Um, and here I have a note to myself, parameters that work. Now I can do uh, training. I did 11 epochs here. But I actually was experimenting with this model a lot before. Oh, well, well. Now I'm in my wrong notebook. Right, that's why. Um, so here we go. Um, I did it for five <laughs> epochs, the last thing I tried, um, just to see. Because I actually, I have a term here I didn't really explain yet something I call beta here that I multiply with. We'll get into that later. Um, I was experimenting with this one. But basically I do training loss, and I do training and I can look at my training loss. And I can visualize these different terms. I have one version here and here I have another version. So let's go look at this one. So this is from my, this is 11 epochs, and I chose the batch size somehow, so that it becomes, it runs the training step around 500, 500 times. And I can visualize the elbow, which is the loss I'm trying to minimize. I have the likelihood term, that's my decoder, and I have the Kullback library divergence, which is down here. You can see there's a big difference in the amplitude of these terms. So uh, the elbow is basically completely dominated by the likelihood term. And this is why, why I wrote this line here. Uh, and this basically means that, um, sorry, scrolling. This basically means that I have trouble training this network because the log likelihood completely dominates, and my uh, encoder I cannot train my encoder properly. Um, and this is basically where I had to stop. Um, so in the paper they discuss this, they put this multinomial loss, and if you remember, that's basically how I said that my click history was distributed from the probabilities of me choosing every item. And then they put this multinomial loss into the model and train it. Uh, so in my case, I have a very sparse representation. And I don't, so if you go back to how the multinomial looks like, it's, uh, no, I have it in the theory part. And that's the other notebook. Anyway, basically you do what you multiply, um, with the log of the probability. And if the probability is really, really small, the log of that becomes big negative number. Uh, so if you have a really sparse representation of sparse data, where a lot of items have very small probabilities, the multinomial loss becomes big, uh, and I am in trouble. So in the paper, they discuss this and they say that multinomial seems to work nicely, but that's in their case, and probably they did something like Vincent suggested, that you remove items that are very low probability, for example. And I think they only take items that have been used at least five times by completely in the data set, something like that. Um, and maybe you can do that to solve this. What I tried was that I multiplied uh, or divided this negative likelihood with some, just some constant to put them on equal footing, um, but it 